Matthew Stafford just became the highest paid player in NFL history. Matt Ryan, highest paid player in NFL history. Kurt Cousins is about to become the highest paid player in all of NFL history. That is the highest paid player in the NFL. Jimmy Garoppolo. Rodgers became the highest paid player in NFL history Not yesterday. Serious. With every big name that signs a new contract becoming the highest paid player in NFL history and a seeming explosion of monster contracts this year, I thought it might be interesting to look at some of the NFL's historic monster contracts and to see how those big paydays worked out for the teams and players involved. It's been the case for a while that when a top quarterback signs a new contract that they become the highest paid player. So let's start there and let's start in 2001. The New England Patriots signed Drew Bledsoe to a then record 10 year $103 million deal. Now Bledsoe didn't make it more than two games into that contract before suffering a now famous injury which paved the way for Tom Brady and come next season he was playing in Buffalo. Now Bledsoe's contract wasn't necessarily a bad deal, this next one definitely was. In 2003 the Vikings signed Dante Culpepper to a 10 year $102 million extension, the third highest contract in NFL history based on earning potential at the time. Now the first two years of the contract looked worth it as Culpepper made it to the Pro Bowl in 2003 and 4, leading the league in passing yards in 2004. But then his career took a nosedive and he played a combined 31 games over the next five seasons for four different teams. Now you may think this next one could end up being a bad deal at the end, but don't be so quick. In 2004, the Colts made Peyton Manning the league's highest paid player with a seven year $99 million contract. Now Manning played out the entirety of that contract, winning NFL MVP on three occasions, as well as a Super Bowl title. He then signed an extension in 2011, which would also serve as his last season in Indy where he missed every game due to a neck injury and then made his way to the Broncos. In 2013, the Cowboys made Tony Romo the highest paid player in franchise history with a six year $108 million contract. Romo served two years of that contract before, well, well, you know. That is a devastating sight. CBS should now make him their highest paid on-air employee, just like John Gruden was at ESPN. I mean, the guy's an all-time great broadcaster already. Is Joe Flacco elite was a once polarizing question and in 2013 the Ravens decided the answer was yes when they gave him a then record 6 year $120 million contract after winning the Super Bowl. Flacco thanked them by posting a career low in yards per completion and a career high in interceptions. It's difficult to argue he's a bad quarterback but it's equally as difficult to justify that contract. Oh, here we go, our first controversial topic. In 2004, the Falcons made Mike Vick the highest paid player in the NFL, leapfrogging Peyton Manning. He followed it up with two strong seasons, making the Pro Bowl in 2005 and setting the single season record for rushing yards by a quarterback at 1,039 in 2006. And then, well... Let's just finish by saying he didn't get to keep all of his signing bonus. A back to back, here we go. Prior to the 2014 season, Colin Kaepernick signed a six year, $126 million contract with an NFL record, $61 million guaranteed. And just a couple of seasons later, he wasn't seen as good enough to be the 49ers starting quarterback anymore. And apparently, had some opinions that people weren't too fond of. I, I don't know, something like that. And at this point, we've seen a lot of big monster contracts go wrong. But as we've also already seen, they can go right, as was the case with Champ Bailey's seven-year $63 million contract that he signed in 2004. Out of those seven seasons, two saw Bailey not give up a single touchdown, and he also set the NFL record for most Pro Bowls attended by a cornerback. In April 2013, Darrell Rivas became the highest paid defensive back in NFL history, signing a six-year deal worth $96 million. Now, Rivas didn't actually have a bad season in Tampa Bay, still making it to the Pro Bowl, but he certainly didn't live up to his contract or his reputation, and he was cut after just one season, then followed it up with a first team All Pro selection and Super Bowl ring in New England. So we'll blame the Buccaneers. In 2011, legendary Iron Man Joe Thomas signed a record setting seven year, $84 million extension. He made it all the way into the final year of that contract before injury ended his incredible streak of 10,363 consecutive snaps. Even if he ended it on IR, he played out that contract. 
On the topic of legends, Larry Legend signed an eight-year, $120 million deal in 2011, making him tied for fifth highest paid player in the NFL. And it's no surprise that a man who forced the Cardinals to sign him to an extension before his rookie contract expired because he was hitting too many performance-based bonuses got a huge deal, which has since been restructured on multiple occasions. But it was definitely worth every penny at the time. And you can't go wrong by paying legends, or can you? Prior to the 2012 season, the Lions signed Calvin Johnson to an eight-year, $132 million contract, one of the largest contracts in sports ever. He followed it up immediately by setting the single-season record for receiving yards and then retired halfway into the contract. Cue the Lions asking for some of that bonus back, making their record for ruining their relationships with loyal franchise legends two for two. Hey Barry, we need that five and a half million back. Here's one you'll all be familiar with. J.J. Watt was on his way to carving a legacy as the most dominating defender in NFL history after just a few years in the league. Now, the Texans recognized this with a six-year, $100 million extension, which made him the highest-paid non-quarterback. He won two Defensive Player of the Year awards following the extension, but has been missing in action the last two seasons due to injury. But before the Texans paid J.J. Watt big money, the Bills paid former Texan Mario Williams just as much, giving him a six-year deal also worth up to $100 million. He gave him three great seasons before falling off the map following the arrival of Rex Ryan as head coach. Time for more modern history. In 2015, the Dolphins signed Ndominkin Sue to a six-year contract worth over $114 million, with $60 million fully guaranteed. Halfway into the contract, Sue was released, making his way to the Rams this offseason. At this point, we've been going back and forth between good deals and bad deals, but now let's take a look at some of the absolute worst deals. In March 2006, Sean Alexander signed an eight-year, $62 million extension, making him the highest paid running back in NFL history at the time. Following the extension, Alexander failed to be available for all 16 games for the first time in his career in his final two seasons with the Seahawks and also averaged less than four yards per carry for the first time in his career. But we all know the Madden curse was responsible for that one. <laughs> Last, and in many ways least, is the story of Albert Hainsworth. Hainsworth signed a seven-year, $100 million contract with the Redskins, but didn't want to play nose tackle, turned up out of shape, regularly mispracticed, and argued with coaches. He was traded two seasons later to the Patriots for a fifth-round pick, before being released by them four months later. All this resulted in Hainsworth being considered the worst free agent acquisition of all time. Overwhelmingly, the monster contracts we looked at turned out to be a bad deal for the franchise more often than it was a good deal, and by that I mean the player never ended up seeing out that contract for the team. Does that mean I'm claiming that Rodgers, Beckham Jr. or Aaron Donald are doomed to fall off? No, and I actually had no prior intention to prove anything going into this. I just knew there would be an interesting story behind huge payouts, and I was right. So the numbers look crazy, and they definitely are, but, you know, both players and teams know what they're doing, and they know what they're getting into. When a contract says X amount of years, it usually means a few less years, with the team now having a strong position to renegotiate from, with the player not having any guaranteed money, but the player also has a high yearly wage. 